was hanging out with the wrong people and thinking that I can handle it, it just kind of took over. That night, about two in the morning, my phone rings. And it's my son. And he tells me that they're doing CPR. This should be easy, God. Why didn't you make this easy for me? The whole experience uh, for me is just something that totally renewed my faith that had been lingering. I know he's there, and I know he's been helping me out through my journey. I can try to write my own story, and it's never going to be as good as the story God writes for me. Good morning. Yeah, I just wanted to affirm today the truth that we all are on a journey, yeah? Can we acknowledge that we're all on a a path in life and we're trying to take reality as it comes at us and we're trying to do the best with our lives we can and here at Whitewater we believe everyone's on a spiritual journey and, and our heart is to help you, help anyone who walks in these people move forward on their spiritual journey because people matter and God loves people. Um, and so anything that we can do to help with that is just our heart. Uh, my name's George. Um, see some new faces out there today. I'm George. i um, 34, one of the pastors here. I have a wife and two kids. Uh, Wesley's about two months old, and my daughter is four and a half, and she loves balloons. <laughs> Golden balloons, like metal-y kind of balloons that are crackly, especially balloons that have helium that make the balloons go up. The other day, my wife caught her in the living room on the sofa, like about to hop off of it going, you can do it, Novella, you can do it. And she was jumping, trying to get this balloon that had gone to the ceiling. She likes to let them go to the ceiling, but she always unties them and then can't get them. And she says, you can do it, Novella. And she saw um, Mama, and she goes, hey, Mama, I'm going to get this. You can do it, Novella. She's just talking herself up. She loves balloons. And when she was younger, when we were walking out, it was, uh, I think it was in the winter, fall time, it it was colder. You know, in one of those evenings that have like that cold, crisp feel, it was twilight, and the, and the, and the, like the sky, the heavens was just beautiful because of the light that was hitting it, and it was slowly fading. And I remember her uh, pointing up from her, um, her little stroller. Uh, this was when she was learning how to talk. She goes, da-boon, da-boon. And we were like, what? Looking around, like, has our daughter gone crazy? And, uh, and then I looked, and she was like, da-boon, da-boon. And I realized she was pointing at this big balloon that's behind our house at a car dealership. It's this big balloon they put up and it changes color, I think, depending on the sale that's going on. Um, But it's always there, like, up in the atmosphere behind our house, higher than the trees. Uh, I think we actually have a picture of it. Um, There it is. (laughs) Da-boon, da-boon, she says. And she thought it was the moon. She thought it was the moon. It was so cute, and you know, she'd always point at it during that season of her life, the, you know, da-boon, da-boon, she thought it was the moon. It was just perpetually right behind her house, like she's going to have these memories. The moon like, would just stop over our house, and it, would, it was so colorful and like, had this attachment to the earth. And um, now she's older, she, she realizes where the moon really is, but wouldn't it have been sad? Wouldn't it have been sad if, um, when she has the realization that that's not really the moon, that she just gives up on the moon? She becomes an agnostic. I don't know if the moon really exists. Wouldn't it have been sad if she just became like totally atheist about the moon? Be like, it doesn't exist. I was lied to. People told me that the moon was this balloon, balloon and I, I've had to find out that it was a balloon. It was all fake. It was a fraud. It's not, I can't believe this. I can't enter into this system of belief about the moon when it was just a balloon. But what if she had just looked a little bit higher? 
You know, wouldn't it be sad if she just became totally atheist about the moon and she hadn't looked just a little bit higher to see that there actually is a moon that actually is orbiting our earth and is beautiful and amazing and much better than the balloon that sits behind our house. And I think it's the same way with our faith in God that often some of us have been told or grown up with this idea about God and we know about God but we, but we uh, have trusted in a balloon in a sense and we haven't actually seen the movement of the real God. We haven't looked higher and some people have given up. They've given up looking They've stopped looking, they've stopped looking up, they've stopped trusting in God because maybe they were sold that this balloon was the moon and they got old enough or they got mature enough or maybe they, in the moment someone even told them, they're like, that's not real, that can't be. And for whatever reason, something has prevented them from actually looking higher and seeing that there really is a God who wants to know them and does love them and, and exists and wants to help them, wants to be in their life. And I just think that um, sometimes we can get caught looking too low. Um, what I want to talk to you guys about today is a story. It's a, it's a story uh, of God's people. We've been going through the Exodus story, how God has freed his people from Egypt. And we're going to look at a story in chapter 19 where God's people are brought to the mountain of God and it's their first experience to come up to the mountain and where God has come down to be with them. It's an incredible passage. It has a lot to, I, I think, a lot to teach us. And it's so dense. There's so much to unpack that we're actually going to try to get through the bigger story, the bigger um, whole of it, and then we'll break down a few of the pieces next week, okay? Um, but this is, if, if you want to know what the, the message is all about, it's how when God comes down, we get raised up. So let's begin. Starting in chapter 19, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't, you can follow up on the screen behind me. In chapter 19, verse 1, it says, In the third month from the very day that the Israelites left the land of Egypt, they came to the Sinai wilderness. They traveled from Rephidim, came to the Sinai wilderness, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Like this passage really wants you to know they're in front of the mountain. This is Mount Sinai. Now, to understand this mountain, though, to understand where this story is going in chapter 19, we actually have to go back to the beginning of the story for a little bit in chapter 3. So if you continue following, in chapter 3, Moses, who's been leading the people, and in chapter 19, he's leading them to the mountain, Moses is actually in the wilderness. He's been exiled there from Egypt. He used to be a prince in Egypt. Now he's living in the wilderness, um, in the desert. Actually, you know, in the Sinai Desert, and he's been there for 40 years, about 80 years old. He's been in exile, and uh, as we see here, he's a shepherd. It says, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. It's not even his flock, it's his father-in-law's, uh, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, Horeb means the uh, mountain of desolation. It's a very cheerful, happy mountain. Uh, the mountain of God. Um, Then, when he's on this mountain, on the far side of the wilderness, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire within a bush. And as Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but was not consumed. There was no combustion going on. And even in this day and age, he knew that fire had to have combustion normally to be happening. But there was no combustion. It wasn't being consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't this bush burning up? I have to go see this remarkable thing. This doesn't make sense. Um, Often when we see God doing unexpected things, it's his his like, it's the way that God gets our attention and he wants us to come check out what he's doing. If you notice that sometimes before we actually hear specifically from God or before we even build a relationship with God or before we know exactly what God's doing, like God does something unexpected and he wants us to turn our attention to look closer, to turn closer and give it a look. I had a a friend who didn't know God, didn't like God, didn't like church, didn't like Christians, thought they're all hypocrites, didn't like it, deeply spiritual, I had grown up with other faiths in her background, didn't want anything to do with God or church over here. But while she was gone on on a trip, her family came to Whitewater, much to her chagrin. But she didn't know this for a while. She gets back from her trip and 
uh, she started noticing differences in her husband. Her husband and her had been on a trajectory, a trajectory that was um, not good for their marriage. It, uh, they were headed in a direction that was, that was very damaged, and, uh, and they had just kind of resigned themselves that probably, inevitably, uh, their marriage wasn't going to make it. So there had been a lot of hardship, and all of a sudden she comes back from this trip by herself and um, sees her family and her husband's totally changed. There's joy in his life. He's laughing and smiling, uh, even joking with her. It doesn't make sense. She's like, what's wrong with you? He goes, ah, well, I didn't want to tell you because it's been going on for a few weeks. I didn't want to tell you or ruin it for you, but we and the kids have been going to church. What? You know I hate church. He's like, I know, I know. He's like, she's like, have you, you're not going to tell me you found God. I, Yes, I got to tell you that I found God. She's like, are you kidding me? And he's like, I ah, know, I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't want you to go. I don't want to pressure you or anything. I didn't want to tell you. And uh, of course, he's hoping that she'd come to church. She's like, ah, well, now I can't not go to church because I'm going to look like a terrible parent if I don't go with our family and our kids. So she started coming and she said every time she would enter the doors of our church, and this is when we were very, very new church, start, starting in Fredrickson Elementary School and... Um, she said every time that she would walk in the door, she was like, I don't want to come back here. I don't even want to be here. But she'd come and sit down, and whatever, whatever she had been dealing with that week, she said God spoke to her about. Like every question she had, every frustration she had, and every intention she had for never coming back again, God would blow through that. And through, like she said, through whatever you were talking, whatever was opened up in the Bible, God would answer that question. It, exactly the thing I was dealing with. And she's like, God started speaking to me. And it was through seeing the bizarre behavior of her husband. This like flame that wasn't combusting, like it didn't make sense to her, like what's going on with him? She turned to him and all of a sudden came to church and began hearing from God. Isn't it interesting when that happens? And I, much to her chagrin, she became a Christian. And much to her chagrin, her whole family found Christ and God worked through that. I, I, I just think it's interesting. What has God been doing in your life and are you turning toward him? Now, um, if we keep going in this um, story to help us understand the other story, and uh, continuing in verse 4, it says, Moses, Moses, and he says, here I am. Do not come any closer. Like he sees this bush, he engages, but then the, God says, don't come any closer. It's not because God doesn't want a relationship with Moses, doesn't like Moses. It's because there's this aspect of God, his holiness, his immensity, his greatness, his purity. He, God is like pure, no sin, uh, selfless, and like we as humans are not that. There are impure motives that we have. There is sin in our life. There is selfishness. Like we, we can't stand in his presence and be, you know, fully pure and great and good like God is immense and great and the other aspect is like we can't handle his goodness we can't handle his greatness like like it would be like someone just running at the ocean in the middle of one of these terrible storms and just throwing them in the ocean and their body's not prepared to live in the ocean like they don't have lungs that can breathe you know like the gills that a that a fish has they don't think if they were at the bottom of the ocean our bodies wouldn't be able to handle the pressure we'd be crushed we are not designed to be just thrown in the ocean so we are not designed to just be in the presence of God in the middle of our wickedness and our impurity and our, our fallenness, we just couldn't handle it. And so he's like, keep your distance. There needs to be a little bit of a boundary, not because I don't love you, but because I love you. And he says, Take, please remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. And then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hears this says he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And I love in this story, like, God says, I'm the God of your forebears, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I had a personal relationship. I'm the God who was, the God who is, and the God who always will be. And in this moment, Moses is realizing that the God who knew his forebears and, and like changed their lives and was the God of his family is speaking directly to him. This God wants a personal relationship with Moses out in the desert, his, his exile that he's been in for 40 years. God comes to meet and speak with him and he's overwhelmed and he can't even look because God is so amazing and he realizes he's standing in the presence of 
of God. We are all called, we are all called to personally experience the greatness of God. We are all called to personally experience the greatness of God, to be looking for the movement of God, to, to, uh, to personally know him, not through somebody else. That's a real popular one in our day and age, like, well, my aunt or my husband or my wife or my boyfriend or my girlfriend, they're good with God, and so it makes me feel pretty good with him. And so our faith can be lived sometimes vicariously through other people, but God wants you to know him. We are called to personally know the greatness of God. You might want to write that down if you have your notes. Um, when I was 13... When I was 13, I went to this event, and uh, it was for men. It was back in the 90s, and it was gathering all these men to, to help them like realign their lives. And it was pe- men who knew God and even men who didn't. And they, they packed this you know, huge stadium full of these guys. And, and then uh, they had like these speakers, and they had worship. And it was in the 90s, and so like, there were all these like, guys with like Hawaiian shirts. And you know, like, there was even some grunge kind of guys coming up to speak. They had the grunge look and feel, you know, in Seattle. And I just remember when they'd have worship come up, they, were, they had two guys. I just, I vivid, this is, probably has nothing to do with the sermon, but I just remember this, and it was etched into my mind. Um, I remember there was one dude who was the flautist. There was a flute player, and he was this huge guy, Hawaiian shirt, and he had this flute, and he just started dancing around the stage. Have you ever seen Michael kind of get into it, our, our worship guy? It was like Michael, the spirit of Michael, embodied in this 90s man playing a, he was not a guitar, not drums, but like flute, and just like looking people down, like looking into their souls, like... And, you know, I remember watching this just thinking, this is so cheesy. Like, even in the 90s, this was cheesy. This is like 60s cheesy. That's like Jethro Tull. Anybody knows that? That's, and, and then there's this guy on the congas, and he was like, boom, boom. And he was sweating just profusely. And he had a skullet. You know what a skullet is? It's like where you just fully only see skull, and then if he turns around, you can see the mullet, okay? A skullet. And he, it was just drenched in sweat, and he's like shaking his head, pa 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 pa. He's hitting these congas, you know, he's got the mic there, and boop, 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 boop. And his sweat is just spraying on all the other band, and they're like, yes, you know? It was so 90s and cheesy. I mean, it was even cheesy for the 90s. I was just like, are you kidding me? I'm 13 years old. And um, in the middle of all this, they had some speakers get up. I don't remember which one, but one guy got up and he started, he opened up the book, the Bible, started reading from it and started preaching. And God spoke to my heart in a way that I'd never had before. Where God just, I mean, I just remember everything just like kind of went still and it was just like God was talking to me. And I felt God calling me to serve him and, and putting a call on my life that like, I was a little scared about, like to serve him maybe in ministry. And my dad's a pastor. I know the good, bad, and ugly about ministry and working with people. And, and, I, and, and I just felt God clearly say, I want you to serve me. And um, I don't know what anybody else got out of that whole thing, but I felt God speak to me. And afterward, I remember trying to describe you know, like God speaking to me, and like I, I, I he, he's, I feel like he's called me to serve. And there's this moment I'm trying to describe, and and I, and there are people that are just like, yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't get that. And he didn't speak that to everybody. It was this was something that was for me, and and there are people that just didn't get it. When I was trying to describe it, have you ever noticed when someone really has an experience with the Lord, there, there'll be like this passion, excitement, and even like this terror and fear and all these jumbled emotions and they're trying to describe what happened, like to describing something spiritual and then they can't describe it physically and it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes that's when you know someone's experienced the Lord because it's so like indescribable. And then I remember talking with some people and just sharing like, man, I just... I, I just was overwhelmed, and I just feel like, man, this is a call. I don't even know what it looks like, but I feel like, they're like, God was talking to you. Yeah, 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 God, God was speaking to me. And they're like, I know, I know exactly what you mean. They knew. I mean, God didn't say that thing to them, but they knew that I was experiencing and I was having a personal relationship and a call laid onto my life. And a call that, you know, somebody could have dismissed a 13-year-old saying, this is what I felt God speaking to me. But 
This call has been on my life. It's the thing that got me into ministry. It's the thing that, um, that, that gave me the conviction to plant a church. And when the going got really hard, when we started a church and things don't go the way you want, it gets really difficult. Like, like it wasn't, I wasn't asked by somebody. I wasn't asked by a family member or friend to, to serve God. God asked me to serve him. So like when I went through hard times and, and I had the conviction that I'm, this isn't for me, God has this call on my life. And that comes from when I was 13 years old. I can remember it. It was that moment where I, me and God, like he spoke to me. Have you ever have a, had a moment where God has spoken into your life? Word of forgiveness, word of encouragement, word of direction and guidance, call, like I want you to go here and to do this. We are all designed and called to have a personal experience, relationship with God. Then the Lord said, I've observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out, and because of their, because of their oppressors, I, I know about their sufferings, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. Therefore, go, I'm sending you to, to Pharaoh, so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And we're seeing Moses in this moment where he's experiencing God and a relationship with him. He begins to know that this God is interested in in justice and mercy. And he's not a God who's just far away. He's a God who wants to be close. And he's not a God who doesn't listen to his people. He listens and he hears them. And he's going to come down and he's going to rescue them. When God comes down, he comes down to rescue. When God comes down, he comes to build a relationship. And and we see here in verse 11, it says, But Moses asked God, "But, but who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and that I should should bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Like you can just see him like standing in the wilderness on this mountain, you know, looking at this burning flame, and there's these sheep that he's been watching. He's been ex- exiled for 40 years, and he's like, but who am I to go back to this country where I'm exiled from? I can't even go back to it. Who am I to lead my people? Like, like I committed an act of violence that got me kicked out of Egypt. Why am I worthy to even go back and lead? How can you use my life? And he's having a real relationship with God. You know, having a real relationship means you say real things to each other. Even if you're like upset or frustrated with God or frustrated with your circumstances, you know, talk to God about it. That's a relationship. Well, God answers him and says, I will certainly be with you and, and this will be the sign that I am the one who sent you. This will be the sign, he says. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you're going to bring people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Every single one of them. They come out, they are freed. You will be at, back at this place, this mountain, to worship me. That's how you'll know that I am the God who sent you. That's how the world will know I'm the God who sent you. And you can trust me because that is what's going to happen. When that promise is fulfilled, you can trust me. God is saying, I'm the God who fulfills my promises. And so we see in this calling that Moses is to go back and take people and free them. And really God's doing it through him, but to bring them to freedom. And not just leave them, like just let them out into the wilderness, but to bring them back to God. And and one of the jobs is not only are we called to personally experience the greatness of God, but we are called to bring others to experience the greatness of God. Now notice I'm not saying we are to experience the greatness of God for them and have faith on their behalf for them. We are to bring them so they experience Jesus, so they experience God. That they see the burning bush, that they begin to have faith of their own. and, And here's the thing, friends, if we don't experience God's greatness, why in the world would anybody follow us to a God that doesn't really seem that great to us? And how could we lead people or lead somebody to something that we haven't even experienced? How could we lead somebody to something that, um, or somewhere that we've never been? This, this is why your life, your relationship with God is so central to a life of faith. You need to be around God. You need to be hearing his voice. You need to be discovering the work of his hand in the world. You need to be wrestling with the the, the things that we wrestle with in life. With God, 
Because if, if, if we aren't experiencing God, how can we lead others to? What does it say about our faith if we're like, oh, we, we say and we'll tell people that there is this God and he loves people and he accepts you and he forgives you and he changes you. And, but we aren't changed by that God and we don't live a life of faith in that God, a life that like, is willing to take risk and a life is, that's willing to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to trust you with my money. I'm going to trust you with my relationships. I'm going to trust you with my time. I'm going to trust you. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to do it even when it doesn't make sense. And like, how can anyone follow someone who claims to believe in a God who does those things and they, they don't live a life of faith? We can't. We can't do it. We, there's no substitute for you having a relationship with God. There's just not. And God has called us to bring people to him. Not to experience our greatness, but to experience his greatness, his glory, his goodness, the riches of his love, his grace, his truth, his power. And Moses is being tasked with that. Some of you, some, I, you got to know this, this isn't like a life of faith isn't just easy. Like, we're all on this journey, right? Like, and I, I, I'm a, I've been a Christian most of my life, and it is hard to live by faith. It's not easy to trust God. And I don't do it perfectly. We don't have to like be perfect. Luckily, we have this perfect God who loves us despite our imperfections, but we do need to trust him and know him and learn gradually to trust him over and over and live a life of faith. Even if we don't understand it, even if you can't comprehend it, and God will take the faith that you have and he'll begin to multiply it. So start somewhere. Start maybe by just being here. You were dragged here. You don't know why you're here. You're here. Someone brought you to experience God's greatness and you're like, yeah, there's just these lights hanging around and there was you know, a band that played and I don't know that I fully get it. But what, what your friend wants you to know for yourself is the God who made you and loves you and will be with you no matter what, unconditionally. They want you to know him. Now we're coming back to chapter 19 so we can actually finish this story. They're at, they, here's the story. In verse 19, Moses goes up the mountain and the Lord calls out to him from the mountain. Where are they at? Moses has brought them back to the place where he first experienced God. This is the place where he experienced the burning bush. This is the fulfillment of God's promise that says, when I free you, you will lead them here and you will know I'm your God. He's led them to the mountain. God is here and and Moses goes up to the mountain. It's an interesting thing. I didn't plan on teaching this, but... Maybe some of us, like the nugget that we needed to hear today, the, like the truth that we needed, is this. Maybe we just need to go back to where it all started. Like Moses has just come full circle. He's come back to where this whole journey started, where he first experienced God, where he first had a call on his life, where he first like experienced overwhelming, where he couldn't even look at God, where he realized this is the great I am, the eternal creator of the heavens and the earth, and, and this God wants a relationship with him, and he came back to where it all started. Maybe some of you guys have been on the journey in life it's just thrown a whole bunch of stuff at you and life's crazy, it's busy, it's stressful and you've kind of forgot your first love and you've wandered away. Maybe you need to go back to where it all started. Remembering that moment where he spoke to you. Whether you're 13 years old, 6 years old, 20 years old or 80 years old, God spoke to you. And this is what Moses says. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. See, God rescues us so that he can have a relationship with us. And so many times we want like a God of convenience. We want a God who will just like rescue us. He'll, he'll, He'll be like the great 
vending machine in the sky, just pop in a few of the, uh, Jesus bucks and, or throw a few prayers up, you know, in our convenience. Lord, if, if you just save me from this thing, I promise I'll always, you know, and God follows through and he helps us and saves us. And then we're like, well, uh, you know, I kind of meant that. And we throw up these prayers of convenience to like a completely committed God, an unconditional God. And um, God is not interested in just rescuing us just to let us go get enslaved to some other Egypt. God rescues us for a relationship with him. Now, Verse 5 says, now if you will carefully listen to me, uh, you know, Moses is supposed to take this back to the people and, um, and, and give a message. Now if you carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession and out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, you'll be my special people. And in verse 6 it says, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. So what does covenant, what does is, what is, uh, kingdom of priests and holy nation mean? You're going to have to come back next week to hear more about that. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. And after Moses came back uh, to, the, to the people, he keeps on going up and down and up and down. And he summoned the elders of the people and set before them all of these words that the Lord had commanded him. And then all the people responded together, we will do all that the Lord has spoken. They're beginning to have like this new relationship with God that's different than, that, than the, anything they've had before. And so Moses brought the people, people's words back to the Lord. And the Lord, again, up and down. The Lord says to Moses, I'm going to come down to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear when I speak and when you, and, and I'm with you and, you will always, and they will always believe you. I love that. The people will hear when I speak with you and will always believe you. You know how, how often Moses said, I had this burning bush experience and God told me and this is what we need to do and God told me and this is what we need to do and none of these people actually heard God say that to him. They've just had to trust Moses and I, I bet some of them are struggling even believing that Moses, Moses had God talk to him. Now it's 13, not everyone believed that God, God was calling me toward this thing. But this is the calling that God had in my life. And you see like people doubting Moses, doubting this story, doubting what, you know, what this whole thing is about. Sure, God's rescued us, that's really cool, but now what are we going to do? And they don't realize that God has this whole relationship designed for them. And so the primary problem, the primary issue for the God's people is that they don't have a personal experience or personal relationship with God like Moses. They've been primarily living off of his relationship, which has been helpful, which has been good, but that's not the ultimate aim. I wonder today who's here that might have a struggling relationship or maybe doesn't have a relationship with God or maybe a relationship's just not what it used to be. What is holding you back from a relationship, like a vivid, awesome relationship with God? I think sometimes unbelief, like we don't, we don't believe, like children of Israel, in the story, they've struggled believing. They str- they've struggled trusting. They don't understand, so I can't trust them. Like sometimes faith is like, you're like not understanding and just trusting God. doesn't mean you don't think. Um, faith is not opposed to thinking. It's, it's opposed to sight. It's opposed to seeing. Are you with me? We're not, we're not supposed to drop our brains at the door when we come into a church or you, be, you become a Christian. Like Some of the greatest thinkers in the world have been Christian. Like God made us to think, but faith is trusting in things unseen. And the people of Israel complained. They complained. Is it possible that lack of belief or complaint and negativity have been keeping you from a relationship with God? Um, Living through someone else's faith. We talked about that. Living vicariously through someone. Maybe some, of, some people here don't have a great rela- relationship with God. And, and is it possible that you would never asked him, God, would you reveal yourself to me? Some people here might never have had like a burning bush moment where God has spoken to them. And God's been trying to, if you were to really look back in your life, try to use all these moments to draw you to that burning bush so you would hear his voice and you would know him on a level you never have. And have you asked him for for that. God, would you reveal yourself? Would you speak to me? Would you show me what you want for my life? 
And begin that relationship. Begin listening. Listen. Open your ears to listen to the God of the universe who longs to speak to us. I was at this assessment. I'll share this with you. I was at this assessment of pastors and um, anybody who's going to be a church planner has to go like, they have to check, make sure you're not totally crazy and they have to run you through a battery of tests and all this stuff. And um, I remember... Um, going through that myself and then they asked me to come back and help assess church planters and make sure that they're healthy enough to and have the skills and the tools to, to do this and we were we were interviewing one guy and had everything all the boxes checked off everything you know just like super talented super smart and done a lot of good things had you know just all the abilities and every all the boxes checked but something just didn't feel right um and I was with my friend, he was, he was hosting this, Josh was hosting this at his church, and he, at the very end, we'd gotten through everything, and we were about to leave, and he just said, well, let me ask you one, one more question. And he said, um, when was the last time you were utterly blown away by God? You were just blown away, and you were just in awe of him, and you were worshiping him, and you were just blown away by the God of the universe. And... Uh, Guy just his eyes teared up. His pastor eyes teared up, and he goes, um, "Not, I haven't done it in a while, and it's not been not been soon enough." And uh, in that moment, a pastor revealing like, "I haven't been, I haven't been worshiping him. I haven't been around God. I haven't been experiencing him." How can we take others into the greatness of God if we haven't been basking in him? Friends, it's so important that we go up to the mountain. Um, we'll look more at this next week, but the, the story finishes that, that, that God says, I will come down. I will come down. And he calls Moses up the mountain and then like lightning happens and the mountains shake and then like it says fire comes down on the mountain and the people are terrified and they have to put a boundary around the mountain because of God's holiness and his purity and his goodness and his greatness and just like Moses couldn't come any closer to the the burning fire the people couldn't come closer to the mountain and just like Moses had this burning bush God comes down in a way where he comes down over the whole mountain and sets it ablaze and then he speaks and people are terrified because of how powerful God is. And they, they, they all of a sudden come face to face. And they have to, to realize that the, you know, we all want this safe God, this God who will give us the God that we want and give us the things we want and accepts us and the God of love. But sometimes I think we want to put God into this box and we want, to, we want this safe God, not this like real God who, actually, who really wants justice, who actually has wrath and who actually is angry. Like when I used to make my, like do something and, and and smart off to my mom, my dad would come in the room and say, what, you know that's my wife? And that my dad loved me, but he was putting me in my place, putting some boundaries up, and some wrath was coming out, and I needed it. Are we allowing God to be God in our lives? Are we experiencing the real God? Are we just turning him into this, like, balloon? When we need to look higher. And I love in this story that God comes down People are freaked out. So when you meet God, you can't describe it. You're kind of freaked out. You're overwhelmed with his love and his power. And then Moses goes up, and, and I love in the New Testament, God knows that we couldn't fully approach him, that we, didn't, we are sinful. He's selfless. We're selfish. He's totally pure, and we've got things in our life that aren't pure. And So he's rent the heavens he broke the heavens and came to earth and sent his son jesus so that he would die on calvary and jesus went up and he and, and onto calvary and god came down and in that moment god took all our impurity and all our selfishness and all the evil and absorbed it into himself so that we could now approach the mountain and that when god comes down we go up and when we go up god comes down and i want to ask you today when was the last time you were blown away by god 
You had a burning bush moment. You saw him. You experienced him. You, you allowed God to speak to your heart. Or has your heart been hard? Have you been hard to reach? When you come to a place like this, do you come to worship? Do you come to criticize? Do you come to like connect with God? Or do you just come to observe what God is doing in his people? Are you, are you coming with a heart that says, God, I want to listen. I, wanna, I want you to speak to me. Because I need you in my life. And when we come with that, because of the blood of Christ, we can approach him. We can know him. We can love him. And we can go up the mountain where all the people had to stay back and only Moses could, could go up. Now we can go up the mountain. And it's really God pulling us up. It's his power. It's his grace. It's his love. And we can experience and be changed. And when Moses, when he was up with the Lord for a long time on this mountain, he came down, his face was glowing. You can see it when people have been around Jesus. You can know it when people have been around God because something in their countenance, something in their character is glowing. What is keeping you from a relationship with God? Go up to him. Prioritize him. And daily, prioritize God. Get some, get some mountain time where you go up. And, you know, I was in a bad mood the other day. My wife can attest to this. And I was just, I was just not myself. I was gloomy and glummy. And it was just like, what's wrong with me? And I was like, you know, I need to get some time with the Lord. I need to go to the mountain. So I just went and took a shower and prayed and, and spent time with him. And I came out to the family. And it was like, and my daughter's like, Daddy's back. Some of us need to like just go be with him. Sundays, these are so important. Like, like God speaks to us through the reading of his word and through worship and through being together. Like we come to the mountain and God speaks to us. And I, like, I, I prioritize church. Even when I'm on like vacation, usually I go to church because I know like God has spoken to me the most deeply and most profoundly in those moments where I, where I come together with God's community, hear from the word. It was at that moment I was 13, God spoke to me there. God spoke to me in, when I was in youth group. God has spoken to me um, through other, situations at church are you prioritizing time on the mountain with him this is mountain time friends so that when you leave this place you're glowing amen let's be ready let's listen and let's experience him let me pray father we love you we're so grateful for you if there's anyone here that's been away from the mountain, away from the earthquakes and the fire and the, you know, the burning bushes. I pray that they would come close and see you and know you and let them be in awe of you. Let them be blown away. And may they hear your voice. And may they respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen.